Now you can see me too and not just uh, hear me typing. I'm getting uh, the TikTok live part set up. Uh, unable to go live. Uh oh. <laughs> Get you into the headspace before class. Nice. I wonder what, uh, for some reason, TikTok is acting up on me. Doesn't want to go live on that end. Don't know what's going on. Hmm. Hopefully, I assume you guys can still see and hear me. I haven't gone out completely, I hope. Um, okay, good, good, good. Here we go. Now TikTok is working. Maybe it was just a brief internet blip. Who knows? Um, but I'm live on TikTok now, too. I get a few people who just watch there and ask questions from there, which, uh, which is fine. Um, so, although I try to get everybody, of course, to come over here because you miss out on the fabulous PowerPoints uh, and my, you know, fabulous virtual background. Hello, Jess. Thank you, as always, for being here. Sure do appreciate it. Um, we're just uh, approaching uh, 3 p.m. Uh, here in uh, in Texas, so we're we're gonna get started here very shortly. I think you guys are really gonna enjoy uh, today's lecture. Uh, Robert Ripley and Ripley's Believe It or Not is really uh, one of my obsessions, uh, if you haven't noticed. Uh, <laughs> and he really was a much more important guy uh, than a lot of people know. Um, and we'll sort of talk about his influence on entertainment today and how uh, how important he was um uh, good now we've got a few people showing up in tiktok too guys i'm lecturing live on twitch if you want to hop over to twitch the link is in my bio i will try to pay attention to questions and stuff here as well um, but you'll miss out on the powerpoint if you don't uh, uh, hop over to twitch so there's that um, but we've got a handful of people here in uh, Twitch, so I think I'm ready to go ahead and get started. Uh, start uh, class on time today. And we will jump right into the lecture of Ripley's Believe It or Not, The Life and Legacy of Robert Ripley. So this is mostly going to be a biography, but also kind of a life and times with uh, some historical context in there too. Um, and we'll talk about, like I said, just how important this guy was. So, Robert Ripley, the guy who founded Ripley's Believe It or Not, is born in Santa Rosa, California, which is north of San Francisco, um, in 1890. Uh, and he comes from a fairly poor family. His father was a carpenter, uh, but he died in 1905. And then the town was destroyed by the San Francisco earthquake in 1906. Um, I mean, literally, it was leveled. Absolutely devastating. Um, and his mother was a laundress and a seamstress. You know, she would... Uh, you know, mend people's clothes and wash people's clothes, and often she would use scraps to make uh, clothes for her son Leroy, um, scraps from the jobs that she did. She would occasionally take in boarders for some extra money too. Um, but so little Robert Ripley was shy and, as you can see, very buck-toothed and sometimes ill-clothed. People would make fun of his clothes and say it looked like a woman's dress, because it was. Um, but uh, he spent most of his time drawing. Drawing was the activity he really enjoyed as a child and a teenager. And he would join the high school uh, newspaper and yearbook staff and put that to work. Um, although he also had to do a lot of part-time jobs to help support the family as a teenager. He, uh, he polished headstones, actually, was one of the, the main jobs that he did. Um, but he did also enjoy playing sports as a, as a teenager, especially baseball. Um, and then he would also pick up handball later in his life, and he would write, I think, the very first uh, professional manual ever written for handball, which is pretty cool. Um, he didn't end up becoming a sports player because he broke his arm when he tried out for a, a professional team. Uh, so we, we got a very different Robert Ripley instead because of that. Uh, but he had some early successes in his art career, so that was good. Um, he gets his first cartoon published in Life magazine in 1908 when he's 18 years old, which is pretty impressive, uh, I would say. Um, and it's this cartoon you see here, this pun, the village bell was slowly ringing. 
um, surely inspired by uh, his mother, the the, the seamstress. Um, and soon after that, that cartoon is popular enough that a family friend is able to get him a job as a sports cartoonist in San Francisco. Now, you have to remember, at this time, you have radio but you don't have tv you don't have any way to actually see what a sports game looked like so they had these sports cartoonists who would go out to the games and draw what happened almost like a court reporter draws what's happening in a courtroom same kind of of idea right uh, so ripley is is doing that he is covering sports games baseball and football and all kinds of things like that um and he's doing okay but he's not doing great um and there's a lot of competition there's not enough jobs and so uh, he moves to New York in 1912, moves all the way across the country with the little tiny bit of money he has on the encouragement of Jack London, of all people, the author of The Call of the Wild. Um, Jack London sort of hobnobbed with the, the San Francisco reporters and that crowd because he himself had served as a war correspondent uh, for a short time with the San Francisco Examiner. Um, so through that circle, Robert Ripley meets Jack London and, uh, and moves off to New York where there are a lot more jobs available uh, and a better chance at, uh, at even more success. And so, again, he, he does okay uh, in the early years in New York, but in 1918 he comes up against a slump. Uh, and this slump is caused in part by uh, the 1918 flu like that we talked about last time. Um, this cancels a lot of sports games, and so there's not a lot for him to draw <laughs> or a lot for him to cover because sports games aren't going on but he's still being expected to meet his deadlines so in december of 1918 uh he compiles these tidbits that he's saved over the years uh just sort of you know as he goes he notices these unusual things and saves them all together all these amazing athletic feats like uh you know uh, this man who broad jumped on ice 25 feet or a man who hopped 100 yards in 11 seconds. Um, and so he compiles this and he turns it into his editor who, en who enjoys it. And he titles it Champs and Chumps. Uh, now, later he will cross out that title and write Believe It or Not on it. But it wasn't titled Believe It or Not at the time. But, as you can see, it is a Believe It or Not cartoon uh, in, in spirit. And so this is the very first one and, and Ripley sort of counts there anniversary of existence, the current Ripley's company, based on the existence of this cartoon. Uh, and so he has this idea of like the strange and unusual that he likes, but then we have to add in this element of, of things that are exotic and things from all around the world that you associate with Ripley's. Ripley gets his first chance to travel uh, outside of the United States in 1920 when he is sent by the newspaper to cover the 1920 Olympics uh, that are held in Antwerp and that really opened his eyes and he sort of uh, pushed to get more uh, travel, world travel assignments. And so in 1922 the New York Globe, the paper he's working for, will send him on a world tour that they call the Ramble Around the World. And this is really amazing trip that he gets to go on, he gets to see lots of the Eastern world in particular, and he will write uh, daily travel essays, a travel journal, basically. Uh, he will send them back to the United States, and he will draw cartoons of the things he sees. And he becomes especially fascinated with India and with Hinduism. He sees things that are completely and totally foreign to him. They're like nothing he ever could even have imagined. Uh, the burning ghats and, you know, the, the, just the way people live in general and the, the, the Hindu ascetics, um, who will do things like hold their arm aloft for years and years at a time um, and do these things that to him were very strange and foreign, foreign in service of, of their religion and their culture. Um, and from this trip, he will end up maintaining a lifelong fascination with India, with China, with Japan, and with sort of all things of the Far East. That always remains his favorite part of the world because of just how different uh, and amazing it is to him. Uh, and then he will get to uh, go to South America later. Uh, in 1925, they will send him just on a trip of South America. Um, and a lot of this traveling is being done essentially uh, the same way a lot of other rich tourists were. There were tourist companies at this time who would, you know, take you around the world in, in uh, planes and, and ships, mostly in ships. 
uh, but there were commercial flights too. Um, and so he's joining too a lot of other well-to-do travelers uh, at this time. Now we come to one of the things you cannot talk about Ripley's without talking about, and that's the shrunken heads. And this is a sensitive topic for a lot of reasons. Uh, this is a very sort of complex topic um, that, that can be hard to talk about. But the basic thing is these shrunken heads, these shrunken human heads, are called Sansas by the people who make them, the Shuar people of South America. The, uh, the Shuar people live uh, in a geographic region from the lowlands of the Amazon River up into the uh, Andes Mountains uh, in, in Peru and Ecuador uh, is the area that these people live in. And they made these Sansas from, uh, from war prisoners, essentially. They would take warriors uh, of the enemy prisoner and, and kill them and shrink their head uh, without getting into too much of the gruesome details. I'm not going to explain too much about how they're actually made. But the reason they did this was to harness the spirit, the soul, of their victims. Um, they believed that these warriors that they killed and all people could have vengeful spirits that could come back to, to haunt and, and to hurt them. And so by shrinking these heads and by sewing the eyes and mouth shut, they contained the spirit within this, this charm, this, this trophy. Uh, and they first become famous, the Shuar, among Europeans, Americans, for this head hunting in the late 19th century is when uh, Americans and Europeans really start to get wind of it. Um, and they start to trade mostly for weapons and weapons to fight their enemy, the Achuar people, who they're making the shrunken heads from. <laughs> right. Um, but the demand for these as trinkets among, you know, again, Europeans and Americans will absolutely skyrocket right around the turn of the 20th century. Um, and so they will begin selling both genuine Sansas and then what they call, what are called souvenir heads extensively in the 1910s. Now with the souvenir heads, there are essentially two kinds. There are ones that are still real human heads that just don't have the same spiritual significance. They're usually made from the heads of the unclaimed dead in morgues. Um, and then you have ones that are actually made from animal flesh, especially sloths or, uh, or goats sometimes, but they'll be made from animal flesh and hair instead of human flesh and hair. But of course, the people selling them are going to tell you they're absolutely real, genuine, uh, you know, uh, uh, significant relics every time. Um, but they all sort of have their own interesting his history, even the ones that are quote unquote fake. Right. Um, and then later in the middle of the 20th century, in like the 50s, uh, you will have what in the carnival business is called gaffs, um, which are replicas and fakes that are made by carnival people and not even made by the Shuar people. Um, and gaffs refers to any sort of replica or fake in the carnival industry. Um, but this, this becomes such an extensive practice that uh, Peru and Ecuador will actually work together to outlaw it in the 1930s. Now, the trade still doesn't completely go away really until the 50s, um, but they work to curtail this because it's becoming a, a serious problem in all kinds of ways. Um, now, Robert Ripley will purchase his first shrunken head from a trader, not directly from the Shuar. Uh, he will purchase them from a trader in Panama City in 1923, um, and sort of an in-between trip of those two big world trips we talked about. And he is absolutely, totally, taken by these fascinated and will continue to buy them at every possible turn. And today, the Ripley collection, including ones that they've bought since his death, holds over 100 shrunken heads, which is by far the largest collection anywhere in the world. It's kind of astounding. Uh, I'm not sure how many even exist still in the world today, probably a few hundred if I were guessing, but uh, Ripley's owns a, a plurality of them, to be sure. Now. Again, it's a sensitive topic. Are these the kinds of things we should display in museums? Should they be given back to the Shuar people? Do the Shuar people want them back? Uh, what about the ones that actually had religious or ceremonial significance versus the ones that didn't? There's a lot of complicated questions in terms of the ownership and display of such things. And I haven't come down where I have an answer one side or the other, but at very least we sort of have to ask the questions of can we display these can we do it respectively, respectfully, and how do we do it respectfully? Um, and again, 
I don't pretend to have the answers, but I at least am asking the question. Um, so, now we have to come to another man, very briefly, who is sort of uh, uh, the man behind the curtain, so to speak, who, who helps Robert Ripley more than anyone else to develop the, uh, the brand. And that's this man named Norbert Perlroth. In that picture, uh, that photograph, the group photograph, he is in gray rather than in sort of that reddish tone to be identified. Uh, Norbert Perlroth is a polyglot and multilingual person from Poland. Uh, he had studied law there, but World War I uh, sort of uh, took him away from his studies. And then he will emigrate to the United States in 1920. And Ripley finds him working as a bank teller in New York City and learns just how intelligent and uh, educated this man is. And so he will hire, uh, Ripley will hire Norbert Perlroth for his language skills and this keen mind. And Norbert Perlroth becomes what Ripley called a walking encyclopedia. This man developed a routine where he researched in the New York Public Library 10 hours a day, six days a week, roughly 7,000 books a year, for 26 years straight he did this. The only time it was interrupted is if he went on a trip with uh, Robert Ripley you know, to somewhere in the world, and even then he was doing the research. But that's a pretty astounding uh, record. <laughs> and then he continues researching just to a less uh, a strenuous uh, routine for another 26 years after Ripley dies in 1949. Um, and finally, he, he actually is replaced by King Features Syndicate, who owns the Ripley's comic strip. Um, he's essentially put into forced retirement. Why? I'm not sure. Um, but uh, we couldn't have Ripley's Believe It or Not without both Ripley and Norbert Perlroth. Uh, this guy was really uh, amazing. And now we come to the actual creation of what we call Believe It or Not. Now, it's important to note that the phrase, believe it or not, existed, but the reason we say it is because of Robert Ripley. It was relatively uncommon uh, uh, up until Ripley brings it to national attention through his cartoon. Uh, you can search, there's, if you know the thing called Google Ngrams, where you can search for like mentions of phrases, believe it or not, explodes uh, in print after 1926. Um, and so in, in 1926, Ripley is working for a paper that, uh, a New York paper that's not very good and really needs some sort of jazzing up. And so he pitches to make, believe it or not, a daily printed cartoon. Um, and this, this quote here is the pitch that he gives the, the editors at this newspaper. Truth, you know, is really stranger than fiction. I have traveled the world over searching for strange and unbelievable things. I have seen white Negroes, purple white men, and I know a man who was hanged but still lives. Believe me when I tell you about the man who died of old age before he was six years old, the river in Africa that runs backwards, oysters that grow on trees, flowers that eat mice, fish that walk, and snakes that fly. Now that's a pretty strong sales pitch. <laughs> and his, his thing was essentially that he wanted these amazing facts that he had researched that he knew people would not believe and would want to challenge him on. He also once said, my business is the only one in which the customer is never right. <laughs> um, and this works. And believe it or not, now, beginning in 1926, is a daily published comic strip where it had been just sporadic before and rarely under that name. Um, and so very soon after, Robert Ripley becomes a very controversial figure in many ways um, for, for this type of, of uh, journalism, for lack of a better word. Um, and he publishes two very controversial cartoons that absolutely explode his popularity and explode his notoriety uh, in the United States and in Europe. The first comes in 1927 when Ripley says that Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh, was the 67th man to make a non-stop flight over the Atlantic Ocean. Now, Charles Lindbergh was being hailed as a national hero. There was a ticker tape parade for him in New York. There was this whole thing. Lindbergh was as big a hero as the United States had at this time. Just, so to say he wasn't the first guy to fly across the Atlantic Ocean was blasphemy. How could you say such a thing? Well, 
Uh, Ripley and Pearl Roth found that there was a duo of pilots who flew from Ireland to Newfoundland across the Atlantic. And also in the years before, there had been two dirigibles that crossed the Atlantic with like 30 some odd people in them. <laughs> so that, by that measure, six, Lindbergh was the 67th man to fly nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean. So it was true, but it was true from a certain point of view, right? Uh, the key word that was omitted here was solo. R Lindbergh was the first to do it solo. Uh, but there's an absolute like nationwide outrage at Ripley for publishing this cartoon. Um, but there's the old uh, adage, there's no such thing as bad press, perhaps you heard, and that was kind of how that worked for him. Um, and then this happens again in 1929 when he publishes a cartoon about the Star Spangled Banner. And in big bold letters, as you can see on it, it says, America has no national anthem. The USA being a dry country, uh, which that's a weird, I don't know what he meant by that. But it said, the USA has been using without authorization a vulgar old English drinking song. And as recent as 1914, Congress has refused to endorse the Star Spangled Banner. Now all this was true. Uh, the... It's complicated. The Anacreontic uh, Society is the name of the drinking club in England, the Gentleman's Club, uh, that had this, this anthem, this song that was their theme song, for lack of a better term. And how that melody became linked to the Star Spangled Banner poem is a whole separate story for, for here. But the point is, it had never been made uh, the national anthem. And so again, there's this huge public outcry, and it leads to a petition with five million signatures that eventually leads a Congress and Herbert Hoover to sign the Star Spangled Banner into, into law as the national anthem, <laughs> where it never had been before. So again, this, this explodes Ripley's notoriety, whereas he was only kind of known um, and mostly regionally known before this. Um, but then he gets a couple of more big breaks because of this. Um, and in 1929, Simon and Schuster will approach him and they will publish the first uh, book collection of Believe It or Not cartoons where they put them all together uh, with some short essays and, and things, kind of like the Ramble Around the World was. Um, and that picture of him there is actually with uh, the second book that was published in 1931, a giant version of the second book. Um, and of course, they're still publishing Ridley's books today. Um, those are extremely popular. Um, but the popularity of this book will then attract the attention of William Randolph Hearst and the King Features Syndicate, which is by far the biggest newspaper, you know, owner syndicate in the world. It may still be today. I'm not sure about that, but it wouldn't shock me. Um, and so they decide they want to publish Ripley's cartoon in their syndicate, in their newspapers. And so the cartoon goes from being published in about 17 newspapers that are mostly uh, on the two American coasts to over 300 newspapers worldwide in 38 countries and in 17 languages. Uh, and it was estimated within a few years at its peak to have 80 million readers. So this becomes an absolute worldwide phenomenon uh, in the early 1930s. It really is an amazing thing. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at the uh, the TikTok here, TikTok feed. Uh, Bright, love your videos, Bright Spot, and my ongoing battle with depression. That is so, so kind of you. Thank you so much. Um, did Ripley ever knowingly publish untrue information? No, absolutely not. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't sometimes get it wrong, especially based on the research you know, capabilities they had at the time, but they absolutely did their best to always be very truthful. Um, my favorite TikTok account. Thank you. Um, so, they hire Ripley uh, to publish, uh, uh, believe it or not, in Hearst Papers, and he's hired at a salary of $100,000 per year, which is not like the largest salary anyone is making, but it's a lot, uh, especially with the Depression going on. It's a very sizable salary, and it's certainly more money than Robert Ripley had ever seen, being, you know, this poor kid from small town California. Um, so in addition to all of these exotic locales and, and strange and unusual things that he sees around the world, he does plenty of fact-finding at home, right? Uh, and so the first nationwide contest for a user submitted, believe it or not, is held in 1932. Um, and the winning cartoon here with uh, Clinton W. Bloom, uh, who, he lost a scrub brush at sea, uh, 
when he was with the army 500 miles off the coast of France, and a year later, the same scrub brush washed up at his feet in Brooklyn. How is that possible? I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but he says it happened. Um, and so that won the grand prize, and his grand prize was an airplane and a complete flying course, um, which would be a, an astounding prize now, not to say anything of 1932. Right, that's uh, that's uh, the prize itself was a believe it or not, right? Um, but a lot of, of these uh, American believe it or nots were sometimes simpler than that too. And these homegrown believe it or not facts were placed right alongside the exotic. And to me, this sort of creates an equivalency between them, right? It shows that Americans are and can be strange and unusual too, just like the things that they think are strange and unusual. Um, and some of the simplest images uh, have become the most iconic Ripley's images. Um, J.T. Sailor's uh, gurning is what it's called when he can, you can put your bottom lip over your nose. The man was able to do that because he didn't have teeth. <laughs> he still actually uh, could stretch his face a little more. Um, believe it or not, I learned to fly this airplane because of a newspaper contest. Yes, exactly. Um, and also, the, this dog wearing dentures has become a classic Ripley's image. And again, this is literally a woman wrote in and, from Shreveport, Louisiana, and said, my dog likes to steal my dentures and wear them. And that, that's also its own sort of believe it or not, right? Um, and so it's really interesting to see these kinds of things all mixed together. Um, and we'll talk about that idea some more as we get to, to the end, too. Mail time. This is one of my favorite Ripley stories. This is astounding to me. So Ripley's explosion onto the national scene will lead to literal mountains of mail. We're talking record-breaking amounts of mail. At the time, they estimated he received more mail than any other person ever. <laughs> um, millions upon millions of, of letters begin to pour in. And that picture in the top uh, left is from a, a short they did, you know, like a theatrical short where he thanked the mail carriers for delivering this mail. Um, but the other thing about this was, keeping in the spirit of things, many of Ripley's readers will send their mail with coded addresses in like semaphore and Morse code and things. Um, or they'll send it with cartoons labeled with Ripley's nickname, Rip, um, instead of an actual address. And this actually blocks up the U.S. postal system. It's so serious. And in 1930, the Postmaster General will put a stop to it, declaring that the USP USPS will no longer decipher improperly addressed letters. Uh, and to me, the fact that he could clog up the mail system like that is, is again, its own sort of believe it or not. Um, of course, nevertheless, the letters will continue to pour in by the millions. Um, they just uh, will be properly addressed there, there forward. Um, and another sort of tidbit about mail that I really like um, is a man who's featured in nearly every museum with a little display, and that's Wayne Harbor, the man who refused to believe. Uh, this man, beginning in 1943, would write to Ripley's and to other like authorities about Ripley's continuously for 29 years for a total of 24,231 letters. Now, I tried to do the math. I'm not a math guy, but if I did that right, it averages like between two and three letters a day, every day for 29 years. Uh, so again, it's amazing to me that Ripley sort of generates his own, believe it or not, through these activities, in addition to the ones that he's finding. Uh, and, and his readers uh, uh, generate, generate uh, believe it or not, facts too. Um, another uh, big event uh, for Ripley is the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. Um, and these first, the first Ripley's museums are called, well, they're all called auditoriums, O-D-D -D, auditoriums, even today. And they were all temporary exhibitions, starting with this one at the Chicago World's Fair. Um, and this is kind of amazing, right? Because people have only been seeing these in drawing form, right? But now people have an opportunity, millions of people have an opportunity to go and see the real people, the real objects, um, that inspired these cartoons. Um, and they'll also hang the cartoons alongside them for you to, to look at. Um, and so people, it's essentially a form of sideshow, right? It's these people performing. Um, and just like with sideshow, we have to sort of ask the degree to which it's exploitative or empowering. And it depends on what they are. You know, if it's a person with a physical 
disability or if it's a person who just has an amazing talent like sword swallowing or like this fireproof man um, it's it's a difficult question but uh, um, what was interesting is that uh, Ripley will re refuse to use the word freaks he does he does see that as sort of a dirty word um, and he uses his own invented term curiosities is the word better I don't have the answer to that. He certainly meant it with respect, uh, so there's certain, certainly that, right? The intent, I think, matters. Um, and he is said to have treated everyone who performed, you know, in his auditoriums with respect and paid them well and all those things. Of course, there's always more to it, but that's the general sort of sense of it. Uh, and these will be uh, uh, very popular, these audit auditoriums. They will pop up at World's Fairs and other events all over the country, from New York to San Francisco, you know, to Dallas, all over the place. Um, and then the first permanent auditorium will open in a building called Warden Castle in St. Augustine, Florida in 1950. Today there are 30, if I remember correctly, 30 auditoriums. Um, so they've expanded quite a bit in, in the, uh, through the decades here. In addition to other attractions, they now build like aquariums and wax museums and all those kinds of things. But these auditoriums are, are a big deal. And at this point, in the 1930s, Ripley is now a superstar. Ripley becomes one of the biggest celebrities in the world, and I really don't think I'm overstating that. And it's interesting to me how little most people know or talk about him now, and that's part of the reason uh, we're talking about him here today. Uh, in 1936, New York Times readers will vote him the most popular man in America. Um, and a poll of schoolboys by the Times will give him the number one spot of who they wanted to grow up to be. Um, and not just because he's super famous, but he's super famous and uh, he, uh, you know, he gets to travel all over the world. He gets to wine and dine women, right? He's, he's, uh, and he's also an inspiration, right? Because he's a poor, you know, uh, um, he's a poor, was a poor kid. He's kind of buck tooth, kind of shy, just a regular average guy who became this superstar. Um, 32 auditoriums currently. I was close. I was close. Um, he'll be an bleh, excuse me, awarded an honorary degree in 1939 from Dartmouth College, uh, and then he will later donate to them over a hundred items. Uh, you can actually see pictures of a lot of them on the uh, Dartmouth College website. They have uh, pictures of a lot of these objects, and most of it was art or weapons from Japan, China, India, those places. Um, so that was that was a nice sort of relationship that they had. Uh, and by the mid-1930s, Robert Ripley is making half a million dollars a year, which is almost 9.4 million. It's over $9 million in present terms. So it's, it's hard to sort of make it an equivalent, right? Because today, the top paid celebrities make tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars every year, depending. Um, but at the time the big Hollywood stars were making less than 400000 He He's get better paid than any celebrity in the country. Uh, Clark Gable, the, the top paid actor, made like three hundred and fifty or 360000 something like that. There was a treasury report that put out how much movie stars were making in 1937. Um, so Ripley is making boatloads of money. Plus, the Hearst organization pays all of the travel expenses. He doesn't have to pay for any of that. The only money of his own he's really spending is to buy and collect these objects from all over the world. Um, but obviously uh, he is making a lot more <laughs> than, uh, than is required for that. So to me that's really astounding that he's able to command such a salary um, at that time. And he becomes known as the modern Marco Polo to many. Um, I've heard that it was the Duke of Windsor, actually, who, who first gave him that title. I can't confirm that, but I like to believe it. It sounds like a good story as any. Um, and Ripley will have traveled uh, throughout his career to 201 out of about 235 recognized countries during his life. He was likely the most traveled man of his time, almost certainly, and he still probably would rank among the most traveled people who ever lived. Um, he logged over 600 thousand flight miles over the course of his career despite a fear of flying he didn't like being in airplanes uh, he took uh, uh, ships whenever possible uh, but obviously that was often very not possible also i have read in some places that he was scared of the telephone that he was afraid he would be electrocuted the fear of flying made me think of that i don't know if that one's true either but it could be um 
But he, he delivered a famous quote uh, that I really enjoy and you see a lot uh, in, in marketing and things still today that said, I have traveled 201 countries and the strangest thing I've seen is man. Which, boy, there's a million things, a million ways you could unpack that, right? Uh, but it's really, again, interesting to me the sort of way he, he, he is able to make equivalencies among sort of all the different people of the world that, that he sees. And I also want to talk specifically about his career in radio, because uh, that was uh, one of the really big things that people don't think about. If they think about him, they're thinking about the cartoons, maybe the museums. Um, but Ripley was a huge radio star. Um, and he'll first sign with NBC in 1930, and then he'll later work with CBS also. But he made, or rather the people at CBS who had to actually do the, the work of the equipment and all that, made a lot of broadcasting firsts in particular with on-location broadcasting. Uh, the Ripley Show will broadcast from the bottom of the Grand Canyon, uh, from inside the Carlsbad Caverns, uh, and they'll actually do that broadcast with the man who discovered the caverns as a child. Uh, he'll do the first broadcast ever underwater uh, in a shark aquarium. You see that here, that shark actually knocked him right on his butt, and he was very scared, and he got out of the water after that. Um, that's actually at... Uh, uh, an aquarium that existed at the time called Marine Land in Florida. Um, and he'll also do a broadcast from a snake pit. Uh, and there's probably some others that I'm not listing there, but it was amazing the, the places they broadcast from. And that was mostly why you tuned in every week, was to, to see where they were or to hear where they were. And he'll be given a posthumous star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1960, specifically for those feats in radio. Um, and some of these radio broadcasts you can find online. They've never put out like an official, uh, you know, collection or anything of them. I've told them they should. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but there are websites where people have like uh, uploaded them, you know, that they've got old recordings of them. So it's worth looking those up. Um, actually, I think Ripley's did officially make the underwater one available, but I'd have to double check. If I can find the link on that, I'll put it in the Discord uh, later. Uh, hello, still uh, checking the, the, the TikTok a little here, mostly getting hellos and I love this accounts, which I love. I love to hear that. Thank you so much, guys. Um, so now, ultimately, we reach the end of the road. There's a lot more things we could talk about, but there's only so much time. Um, and throughout the 1940s, Ripley had been plagued by a lot of health problems, and some believed that at some point in the early 40s that he might have had a small stroke. Um, and that caused him to gain weight and it affect his speech patterns and some other things. And he was also a heavy drinker, Ripley was, even while he was working, especially while he was working. He actually, uh, when he begins uh, filming theatrical shorts and television shows, he almost always has uh, an adult beverage there uh, with him to help calm his nerves, because again, he was kind of shy and kind of nervous despite being this big superstar. Uh, but while filming the Believe It or Not television show in May of 1949, he will suffer some kind of a heart palpitation live uh, during filming. Um, and uh, actually, is one of those, again, sort of Believe It or Not things, he was giving a talk on uh, the origins of taps and taps being played at military funerals, uh, the song Taps. Um, and that's when he has this heart palpitation. Uh, he'll be admitted to the hospital, and uh, he'll be there about a week or so. He'll actually call a couple of friends on the phone and say, you know, we'll, we'll party again when I get out, but he will, he will sadly pass away on the 27th of May, 1949. But he leaves behind a huge legacy. Uh, I, again, I really think uh, we can't under, understate, or we can't overstate, excuse me, how important that he was to, uh, to the development of popular culture as we know it. Um, and one of the qu quotes I really like from him is, facts to be interesting must be very close or very far away. And that was really insightful, right? So again, very close, things like a dog that steals dentures and wears them, or very far away, the, the, uh, the str you know, things that he saw as strange that the Hindu people did, right? But he also equated those two things. And he said, the strangest thing I've seen is man. People are weird everywhere, and we all do all kinds of weird things, and we should celebrate it. We should bask in our weirdness, right, and believe it or not. Uh, he will bring the world, if they have them, they should do it. Uh, you were talking about the radio, and I just now missed that, or just now saw it. 
Yes. Uh, I don't know how many they have, like, in the vaults or whatever, or how many have been, you know, digitized, all those kinds of things. Um, you would think I would. I need to I need to talk to the people I know and see uh, just how much they actually have. Maybe I, I can get in there to, to research them or something at some point. Um, but Ripley will bring the world to regular people, right? This is a time before TV, um, before YouTube and all those kinds of things, certainly. And even, you know, the degree to which you saw things in the newspaper was, was debatable, especially depending on where you lived. But everybody in the country, basically, or every, every city, every place with big newspapers was getting to see the Ripley's cartoon. Uh, and, and he's bringing these, these experiences, these facts, these things to people um, in the United States, in Europe, all over the world. Um, and he will teach people, right, to see the extraordinary in the ordinary. Like I said, right, he creates this equivalence between, you know, things that people think are normal and things that people think are not normal. Um, and that's really, really fascinating. And he has this enduring appetite for the unbelievable and for... Uh, the grotesque legacy of pork pie the first independent person to see the ripley's archives this is a true fact uh, the the uh, the person in charge at the time told me when i went to the ripley's archives a few years ago that i was the only person that had ever been in there that they hadn't invited themselves uh, and that was quite a treat quite a pleasure that they allowed me in there i was actually reading the ramble around the world newspaper essays um, so he has this enduring appetite for the unbelievable and grotesque um, and his biographer, Neil Thompson, who wrote a biography a few years ago, said that his work was a foreshadowing of YouTube, of reality TV, and other pop culture phenomena from Fear Factor to America's Funniest Home Videos to Jackets. Right, we can see elements of what Ripley did in all of these things. Uh, and, and we can see how he dis discovered people's appetites for such things. Now, of course, he wasn't the first to do this, right? You certainly could look to... P.T. Barnum, for example, before him, and, and many others. But he he put it all together in a way that very few ever had. Uh, and he had the advantage of, of technology like radio, too, to help him spread uh, uh, this knowledge. And, of course, today, Ripley Entertainment is a company that very much lives on through the museums called auditoriums, right? The books that are still being published... Uh, the television programs, there's been those periodically. Most recently, they had one hosted by Bruce Campbell. Um, they have web content. They have a great YouTube channel. Now they have TikTok. Um, the Daily Cartoon is still running. They advertise it as the oldest continuously running comic panel, the one that's, one that's still running. I think there's a b debate to be had over whether it's them or Gasoline Alley, um, but that's, that's, that's a tough one. Um, but so there's all kinds of Ripley stuff still, uh, and, and you see his name all over. And again, we all still say the phrase, believe it or not. <laughs> if nothing else, that certainly is, is a legacy. So now uh, we've, we've reached the end, um, and I am happy to take any questions, any comments, anything you would like to talk about. I will try to look in the TikTok chat here as well. Who am I talking to? If you're still here, I'm talking mostly to uh, Twitch. I do these lectures on Twitch, um, but I try to pay at least some attention to TikTok here too. Um, but if there are any questions, any comments, like I said, I'm always happy to take those. Uh, but this was another longish one. This was kind of like the labor one where we really uh, talked a long time. But I had a lot of things I wanted to say. <laughs> um, like I said, this is a really... Uh, this is one of my obsessions. Um, and I've always liked Ripley's Believe It or Not, even when I was a, a little little kid, although it's only been in the past, I don't know, five-ish years, something like that maybe, that I've become really, really uh, well and truly obsessed. <laughs> um, what's your Twitch name? Uh, Professor Pork Pie. Same, same name on Twitch. And there's a link tree in my bio, and you can go to the... Uh, the link there and you can go to my Twitch channel. I also upload the recordings on YouTube after the fact. Um, I just like hearing you talk about this stuff. Thank you. I like to hear that. Um, do I have a favorite buy on cartoon? You know, there's so many, but for me, it's hard to top that original controversy one of Lindbergh, man, because it, it really encapsulates so much uh, about the way believe it or not works right all you have to do is change one word and the fact is true but it's still upsetting and you have to like think about it um, 
So I, I think Lindbergh might still be my favorite, um, but there's, you know, trying to choose, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult. I've actually been to a Ripley's Believe It or Not in, down in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. I visited the Gatlinburg location for the first time a month ago, something like that. Uh, I don't remember exactly now how long ago my road trip was. Um, but uh, I've been to, how many locations have I been to? Uh, I'm nearest to the Grand Prairie, Texas location, so I've been to that and the San Antonio, Texas one several times. Been to Branson, Missouri, Gatlinburg, Orlando a couple of times. So a five or six, I think there's one I'm forgetting that I've been to somewhere. Um, I've been to quite a few <laughs> of the auditoriums. Uh, oh, New York City, that's the one I was forgetting. I've been to that one as well. Yeah, I believe he just went there himself. I sure did, uh, uh, and that, that was a great time. And that's the one that's been the most recently uh, redone, has gotten you know new things and, and new, uh, uh, new exhibits and new you know, displays and, and things like that. Uh, and it was it was very well done. I had a I had a good time. And Gatlinburg also has a Ripley's Aquarium. Uh, the Ripley's Aquarium there is a lot of fun. Uh, they're not paying me to say any of this. None of it's sponsored. I just love Ripley's, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> hello, hello, TikTok people. Um, but yeah, well, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this. I certainly did. Uh, I. Hope to be back again uh, next week. That's my plan as of right now. My hope is to do these every Sunday or nearly every Sunday now that I'm really back on track. Uh, but uh, since it looks like we're uh, done with questions and comments, I will sign off uh, and I will see you guys next time. Thank you again all for being here. Bye-bye.